Uh, and I want to suggest, and I, I'll, I'll give you my conclusion at the beginning, that it's genuinely a big deal because it's about the rights and status of educators and it's about the quality of education. Uh, it's about who has control in the workplace. So it's not an abstract kind of thing that certain elite people have or have uh, uh, for unknown reasons. It's a central issue if educators want to have control of their own workplace. Um, there are four elements to, uh, to academic freedom. There's a lot of misunderstanding about academic freedom, but it really comes down to four things. The first is with regard to teaching. That is, teachers should have the freedom from prescribed orthodoxy, from outside interference, to do their teaching as they see appropriate. I mean, we recognize certain boundaries and that you have to teach with, broadly within the curriculum and broadly within the course description, but how you teach, how you assess, should be, under academic freedom, the decision of the teacher. Academ academic freedom, the second aspect, is with regard to scholarly work, whether it's work you do in preparation for your teaching, whether it be research that you do, um, any form of scholarly work, again, should be free from outside direction, from uh, prescribed doctrine. A third part is what's called intramural academic freedom. This is your right to be critical of your own institution and of the practices and policies of that institution. It's really a vital aspect of academic freedom for reasons I'm going to talk about. And the fourth part of academic freedom is extramural academic freedom. That means as an educator, you have every right to participate actively as a citizen in the society without your employer being able to take action against you for you doing that. So if you want to speak out on issues, they can't say, well, you're not, you can't do that. If you make controversial statements, um, after 9-11, for example, uh, Sunera Tabani, who had been the uh, head of the Act uh, National Action Committee on the Status of Women, was on a panel talking about the uh, devastating attack on the World Trade Center. Uh, this was a panel with several MPs. And she talked about, well, you know, it was absolutely horrible, but if you want to understand it, you have to uh, know the context of American foreign policy and how people could become so angry. That's not an excuse, but it's part of what you have to understand. Immediately, there are demands that she be fired from UBC for speaking out. The biggest donor to UBC said, I'm going to cease donating and I'm going to organize other donors to quit donating to the university until you fire her. So those kinds of pressures often come up uh, insofar as any of us take controversial positions in public. And academic freedom says, we have a right to do that. You know, if we're participating in a, a demo and the cop comes to arrest us, we can't say, oh, I'm a college teacher, I have academic freedom. Uh, but you can stop your employer from taking action against you for what you do in exercising your rights as a citizen. So that's, that's what academic freedom is. Now, the question is, in Ontario, who has academic freedom rights? 100% of Ontario University teachers. 0% of Ontario college teachers. And the big question is why? And I'm going to give you a long answer and then a short answer. The long answer is it exists in universities. You have to look at the starting point for universities. Universities began as small, elite institutions. In Ontario, I mean, well, in Canada in the 1930s, only 3% uh, of the population participated in universities, 3%. Um, the general statistics that are used internationally is you have an elite university system if under 15% participate. We were at 3%. Um, what went along with that was university teaching grew out of almost a craft or guild tradition. The notion, which is a very good notion, and Smokey was speaking to it, academic staff are the ones who should make academic decisions. That was the notion that infused the university for decades, or centuries actually. 
and the academic staff are the ones who should make the decisions about what courses are offered, what programs are offered, what the curriculum is, who's hired, who's promoted, what are the standards. Um, those are academic decisions. They should be made by academics. And some of the oldest universities in the world still have the purest form of that. At both Oxford and Cambridge, there's not a board of governors. At uh, Oxford, there's something called the congregation. And at Cambridge, there's something called uh, Regent House. And those are the final decision-making bodies. And they're made up of all of the faculty in the university. That's the final authority on every matter. So that's a pure form of, of this version that academic staff should be making the academic decisions. So that's the context in which 20th century universities in this province uh, uh, emerged. There was a royal commission in 1906 on the governance of the University of Toronto that looked at this question and decided that this policy should apply and that every university, including the University of Toronto, should have a senior academic body that makes academic decisions. In most places in universities, that's called a senate. And there should be a board that deals with financial and administrative matters, but the academic decisions are to be made by the academics. So the legacy is that form of what's called collegial governance, where the colleagues, collegial doesn't have to do with congeniality. If any of you have spent much time in universities, uh, faculty are known to be very uncongenial to each other. I've been in politics in the trade union movement, I've been in politics in real politics, and I've been in politics in the university. No place is it nastier than the university. Partly, I think, because it's often so much backstabbing. Now, I'm sure that doesn't happen in college. Uh, uh, so collegial here, we're not talking about congenial. We're talking about a, a system of col a college, like the College of Cardinals. Uh, the college, the collegium, makes the decision. And that's a legacy from the origins of the university. What goes along with that is academic freedom. If you're the body that's going to make the decisions, you have to have the right to express your views, not only about teaching, about research, but also about how the place runs. So that's the context in which academic freedom has been a part of universities. And what's gone along with that to protect academic freedom to make it possible is a system of tenure, um, which isn't a job for life, but it's that you can only be terminated for just cause and after a rigorous, rigorous procedural review. But there are other things that have accompanied academic freedom that are characteristic and uniquely characteristic to universities. One is that faculty own their own intellectual property. Your lecture notes, your course material, anything you write belongs to you, not to the employer. In almost every other workplace, the work you do as an employee is deemed as work for hire and belongs to the employer. That's not the case in universities. And the reason for that is academic freedom. If the employer owned what you developed, then your course would belong to them. Now, the title of the course, the outline for the course is belongs to the university, but how you give that life in your lectures, in your course material, in your tests, and so on, is yours. And it's to protect the, your academic freedom. Similarly, uh, in universities, unlike any other uh, public institution that I know, academic staff have custody and control of all the records they create. So every email, every letter, every note you write, every post-it note, uh, every message slip, any correspondence of any sort is a record. And in every other workplace, the records you create in the course of your work are in the custody and control of the employer. In universities, they are not. They're in the custody and control of the faculty member. And this becomes important when our institutions come under access to information legislation. Because what access to information legislation says is that any records in the custody and control of a public body are accessible subject to certain restrictions of uh, exemptions or uh, restrictions. When universities came under, uh, suddenly there were demands for various emails from faculty, various other records they had done, drafts of their papers, uh, their course notes. And we fought all that because they're not in the custody and control of the university, therefore they don't come under the legislation. And the reason for that is academic freedom. In the absence of academic freedom and in absence of faculty 
having custody and control of their own records, your dean can walk into your office anytime and go through your file cabinet. They could go through uh, all your email on the server to see what you're writing, what you're criticizing, who you're saying. They could demand to see uh, drafts of your uh, course notes or a paper, paper you're working on. It would create, from an academic freedom point, a really chilling environment where you'd be less uh, willing to express your views. And again, going back to the historic notion of a university, if it's to be collegially governed, people need to be able to express their views. They don't, they don't need to be looking over their shoulder what the employer is going to think of what they're saying. So let's look at the starting point for colleges. Uh, for the most part, uh, colleges grew out of vocational institutions. And the view of teachers in the college was as provincial employees. Uh, one of the reasons that college teachers in almost every province are members of their provincial government employees union. University, I mean college presidents didn't see themselves as head of the institution in the same way. They saw themselves more as assistant deputy ministers and were held accountable in that way. And there's a lot of variation across the country. The most extreme form of this, the most recent legacy of this, you see in Nova Scotia and in New Brunswick, where they're still in the civil service. Uh, and it's the civil service model that applies. So the notion that the academics control the institution, no, no, it comes down as it does in every other uh, provincial government department. We have one example of that in the university system, and that's Royal Military College which is actually one of the finest universities in the country and has the most extensive liberal arts requirements of any university in the country. It's, it is a really good university and, and the faculty there are, are as, for the most part, civilians, faculty with PhDs or you know, uh, credentials like any, any other university. But they have to negotiate their collective agreements with Treasury Board. And they fall under the Department of National Defense civilian HR policies. So their starting point is very much like college starting point. And the legacy of that is they don't have academic freedom like you don't have academic freedom. Uh, they don't have tenure at Royal Military College like uh, college teachers don't have tenure. Uh, all of the, the context is very much of a traditional civil service context as opposed to an academic context. So I'm suggesting that, that the reason why it's 100% academic freedom in universities and 0% in college, it has a lot to do with the origins of the institutions and the traditions that build up over time. Now the challenge for university teachers these days, I'm using Oxford as a model of the, probably the most extreme form of uh, academic control of, of academic matters. Um, successive British prime ministers have been trying to change that and introduce boards of governors and so on and have failed. But the problem for university teachers in Ontario, as well as across the rest of Canada, is that we have university presidents, senior administrators, whose model is not Oxford, but Walmart, <laughs> whose notion of a good HR policy is casualize as much of the work as you can, outsource it, get the cheapest labor you can, get rid of all of the inconvenience caused by having committees and a collegial governance structure. Uh, that's not efficient. We need flexibility. Uh, it really is a Walmart model. Now, every aspect of what I described about universities is under threat. So precisely the point we're talking about how you gain it, university academics are fighting to protect it. Collegial governance. That Royal Commission I mentioned in 1906 that recommended there be a senior academic body that makes academic decisions, and that's called a senate almost everywhere. Ironically, the one place that isn't is the University of Toronto, which that Royal Commission was looking into. But they have the equivalent of that as an academic board within their governing council. Has never worked. One of the great myths is that senates have been a way in which academics control academic matters. Um, it's a fiction. 
it's a, a place where the academics can win maybe one time out of 10, one time out of 12. Um, it largely is a rubber stamp for what the administration wants, while giving the appearance of being in the control of the academic staff. Uh, I don't know if any of you studied Pavlov in first year psychology. One of the things Pavlov talked about is one of the best ways to build commitment is through what's called inconsistent reinforcement. You don't know when you're going to win, you don't know when you get patted on the back, but you do occasionally and unpredictably. Well, that's precisely my explanation for why academics love senates even though they never work, or they rarely work, or inconsistently work. Um, in, 19, in the early 1960s, CAUT and the employers organization set up a task force to look why senates weren't working. And they said, well, the theory is great, we just have to make all these reforms. Um, didn't fit, every university adopted them, didn't fix it. By the 1990s, same problems. CAT uh, created a committee called the Independent Study Group on University Governance with the attractive acronym of ISGUG um, <laughs> that visited all the universities across the country. Why aren't Senate's working? Why, aren't, why isn't there a real academic voice? They said the model's fine, we just have to introduce reforms that hasn't worked. Um, uh, so they were introduced these reforms, it's still in working. So we've come to a conclusion in CAUT that the problem's the model. There's only one place where the staff of universities have equal standing with the employer, and that's at the bargaining table. And the place that we're going to protect the academic values primarily is going to be in collective, collective bargaining. We do what we can through the sentence, but the whole notion of collegial governance is under threat because it's absolutely inconsistent with the Walmart model of human relations. Equally under attack as a result is academic freedom. The employers organization which is called, for universities, which is called the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada, um, on its 100th anniversary developed a new definition of academic freedom. And it was convenient they did it on its 100th anniversary because they were attempting to take the concept of academic freedom back to what it was 100 years before. Where they do talk about it in regard to teaching research but not with regard to intramural academic freedom. Oh my God, we can't have faculty being critical of the institution or of the administration. And we can't have extramural academic freedom. So they deleted that. So the whole concept of academic freedom is under attack. Uh, tenure is under attack. Tenure is under attack primarily through casualization. In the United States, in four-year degree-granting institutions, more than 70% are neither tenured nor tenure-track. So that means they're in contract or other casualized position. More than 70% at four-year degree-granting institutions. The government of Canada solved the problem for us by not collect collecting any data. So we don't have a clue. Um, the government of Canada used to do a college faculty survey, which they discontinued in the 1990s. They did a full-time university survey and a part-time university survey. They, they discontinued the part-time university survey in the 1990s. Because big employers like the University of Toronto said, we can't fill out your questionnaire. We don't know how many we have. Which seems a little silly given that they pay them checks and pay them wages and give them library cards. But anyway, so they discontinued that. And Stephen Harper solved the problem now altogether. They've discontinued the full-time university faculty survey as well. So we're the, probably the only industrialized country in the world that has no numbers on how many people teach in colleges and universities, let alone whether they're full-time or part-time. We have a lot of anecdotal information, and I would bet that uh, the, the percentage who are casualized in universities are between 40 and 60 percent. Uh, and I'm sure this is an issue in colleges, uh, as Ted has talked with me and others. Um, the attempt to take control of intellectual property with the proliferation of online education, the university is saying, well, those courses, you may develop them, then we have technicians who put them together and put them on, so this is really university commitment, so the university owns it. Where that leads is they don't need you. Once you've developed your course, they don't need you anymore. You can develop the course. They can hire cheap labor to grade the papers, uh, to respond to student questions. They can hire a graduate student every couple of years to uh, update the course. If the premier or a wealthy donor doesn't like something in the course, they can delete it. 
uh, that's, what they're that's the kind of control they're trying to, to get. We've been fighting it off pretty successfully. And custody and control of, of records, they're arguing, oh, no, no, all those records are on our server. All those emails you said are on our server, what do you mean we don't have custody and control? Uh, well, the reality is where the record is is absolutely irrelevant. If you have a record that's in the, that's in the custody and control of your institution, it doesn't matter whether you have it at home or in your office, you have to turn it over. On the other hand, the fact uh, that you have a record in your university-owned file cabinet in your uh, university-owned office or on the university email server is irrelevant as well. In the same way when you mail a letter, the fact that it's in a Canada Post letterbox or in a Canada Post sorting station doesn't give them the right to look at it. In fact, they have to get court authorization to open your mail. But they're trying to attack that. And if those things go, they're really undermining the role that faculty have to be able to play uh, in an institution. So the response in the university sector has been unionization. In 1970, there wasn't a single unionized university teacher in the country. Now 90% are unionized. Um, and as I mentioned, we've turned to collective bargaining to solve things. So we protect academic freedom in our collective agreements. That's the only protection for academic freedom for anybody in the country. Insofar as the university policy makes reference to academic freedom, it isn't worth the paper it's written on because it's absolutely unenforceable. Some of our most egregious violations of academic freedom, one of which was the case of Dr. Nancy Oliveri at the University of Toronto, which some of you may know about. Um, University of Toronto in its policy statement has as fine a statement about academic freedom as you could ever want. I point to it often as a model and it wasn't worth the paper it was written on in Nancy's case. So if you don't have it in your collective agreement, you don't have it. Uh, protections for tenure, protections for intellectual property, all are secured uh, in the collective agreement. So the challenge for universities, teachers, is to build those protections that we inherited from decades or centuries ago, build them into collective agreements because in the Walmart vision, none of these things should exist. Now the argument I'm making today is universities have these things not because universities are special places. There are historic reasons why university teachers have these. But the logic behind them is as applicable to colleges and college teachers as it is to university teachers. Uh, educators should be the dominant voice in academic decision making. Whether it's in a course on auto mechanics or 13th century philosophy, and that will be more people who know about auto mechanics than 13th century philosophy, but the logic that the teachers are the ones with the knowledge who should be developing the curriculum is a right that should exist in the colleges every, as much as in the universities. All educators need academic freedom. The logic for the importance of academic freedom in teaching applies no matter what subject you're teaching. And insofar as the, I mean, we get a whole variety of responses. I mean, Ted perhaps could talk about when you put forward demands for academic freedom in bargaining other than them probably saying, hell no. Um, the rationale, you know, it's somehow, well, I mean, ones I've been told as well, college teachers do more vocational work. Well, universities do a lot of vocational work. You know, universities train nurses, universities train doctors, universities train lawyers, universities train pharmacists. Um, and, you know, one of the, if you're a surgeon doing routine tonsillectomies, you probably have a more jo boring job than an auto mechanic. Um, so it's not, you have much of a high status one, but that's not the issue. Whether, whether you're teaching vocational or abstract stuff, it's the educator should, who should be making the decision, should have the freedom to do that, and that should be reflected um, in their academic freedom rights. And in scholarly work, scholarly work can be pure research and grants that universities do, but scholarly work is also what you do to prepare for your courses. Um, you have to have a voice in the running of the institution a real voice, and a right to be critical in colleges as much as universities. 
and college teachers certainly should have the same protections as any other educators to be full citizens in their society and not to worry that their employer is going to take some action if they zealously uh, pursue their rights as a citizen. And college teachers should have the same kinds of protections uh, for their academic freedom as university teachers. Uh, tenure is a wonderful concept. As I say, it's not a guaranteed job for life, but it's that the employer cannot get rid of you after you've gone through a lengthy probation, except for just cause and through a rigorous process. Um, you should own what you create, and you should have custody and control of your records. Now, what I'm arguing is academic freedom is important in itself. It's important for the quality of education. It's important for you to be able to play the role in the classroom that you want to play, you're best equipped to play, and you should play. But it's also, and I'm sure the reason it's fought so vigorously by employers in the college system, it's symbolic of a role for educators uh, in the classroom, in the institution, and in society. There are two visions. Um, and one vision is that the academic staff that's the, should have that freedom, should have that role. That's, that has to be recognized formally. The other vision, I just picked two people at random. Some of you may know John Tibbetts, the president of Conestoga College. Uh, I just put his picture in this to represent the employer's contrary position. I remember John from when I was at the Ontario Federation of Labor. He's still here. Still, I imagine Ted doing the same things. Is anybody here from Conestoga? Am I besmirching your president's name? <laughs> the, other, the other fellow there is Peter McKinnon, who just retired as president of the University of Saskatchewan, who wrote the AUCC policy on academic freedom that's trying to really undermine what it is. So there's sort of two visions. There's a vision of academic workers that we really should have that worker self-governance model of our institutions that comes historically from a university tradition. And there's the employer's vision that, well, that may have been okay 100 years ago. Walmart is where we need to go in the 21st century. So the challenge for college teachers, since you have a lot of employers who embrace this model, I'm sure a lot of university presidents are taking lessons from their college counterparts, is to reject that forcefully. So the question is how to move forward. And I take it that's going to be part of the discussion we're going to have over the course of the day. The key to it, as you already know, is collective bargaining. The only way you can secure any of these rights is at the bargaining table. But that's not easy to do. I mean, how many, how many rounds has academic freedom been a demand at the bargaining table, Ted? At least five. At least five. Right? So saying that we've got to do it in collective bargaining and coming up with the language is not the problem. We have hundreds of examples of good academic freedom language. CED has a model clause on it. Uh, we can supply all the language. The problem isn't recognizing it has to be done through collective bargaining. It's figuring out how to achieve it through collective bargaining. The first round of bargaining I was ever in, I was actually uh, uh, went with a, uh, the president of the energy workers union at the time, and they were negotiating with one of the big refineries. And they were saying, here's our wage demands. Uh, and here we've examined your financial records and you can easily meet these. And the chief on the other side for the employer said, you're absolutely right. We can afford to pay what you're asking. It's not a question of whether we can, it's whether you can force us to. And that's really the issue in bargaining. So in order to be successful at the table around this kind of issue, it means educational work with our members. So our members understand that academic freedom is not just this abstract thing that belongs to people who teach at the University of Toronto, but rather a fundamental right that every teacher should have, and the reasons for that. We have to build alliances around this with student organizations, with alumni, uh, with other educators. Uh, the employers love to divide university and college teachers. Uh, we have too many university teachers in CAUT who love to divide university teachers and college teachers. And that's getting harder and harder to do because the two are sort of merging together. 
So in BC, five colleges became university colleges and now are universities. Uh, in Alberta, uh, two colleges became universities last year. In Ontario, the polytechnics are pushing, and I, I saw something where the, the government was suggesting they'll likely be giving three-year degree granting status. So, so, I mean, all those phony distinctions between colleges and universities are breaking down in any case. So we, uh, I mean, that's an occasion to say we should have the rights, but the reason you should have the rights is not because you're becoming universities or you're giving degrees. You should have the rights because you need them in order to do your job well and offer good quality education for your students and the public. Another part of being, we have to make this a public issue. We have to help the public understand these are rights we need as college teachers in order to have even better quality programs and a better quality institutions. The final thing we have to do in this moment in time is defend labor rights. The assault on labor rights is happening at every level of government. Um, you know the federal government uh, has brought in Bill C-377, which is going to impose reporting requirements on every local union, every provincial union, every national union, every federation of union, and every other non-union group representing employees that are the most onerous reporting requirements of any institution in our society. It will cost we, we still don't know, we're trying to estimate the cost. It'll cost enormous amounts of money to comply with these reporting requirements. And they're intrusive, they'll give the employer all sorts of information uh, that the employer will be able to use. Uh, yesterday or the day before, and this was introduced as a private member's bill, so the government said we didn't introduce it, but they whipped their uh, caucus to vote for it, so it's going forward. It, it's in the Senate right now, it's gonna pass in the Senate. Uh, they introduced a private member's bill yesterday or the day before to change labor rights for those in the federal civil service to organize 60% or 65% of people in federal jurisdiction are unionized, but people who work in a lot of trucking and in the financial industry are not. Now to unionize, there's no card check. You have to sign up 45% to be able to ask for a vote. And under this bill, a vote is only successful if you get 50% of the entire bargaining unit, not 50% of those who vote. So everyone who doesn't vote is a no vote. And then for decertification, you have to get 45% to sign up to get a decert vote. But the vote isn't whether to decertify under this bill. The vote is whether you want to continue to be represented by your union and you have to get 50% of the bargaining unit voting yes to continue representation or you're decertified. So that's two pieces of legislation. You know what Tim Hudak is planning in Ontario. If he comes to power, one of his highest priorities is introduce free rider legislation, which will mean OPSU cannot collect dues except from individual members Employers cannot collect dues even when the worker consents. You have to go around and collect them. The union has to go around and collect them. Um, but the union still has a duty to fair, fairly represent everyone in the bargaining unit, whether or not they pay dues. And he's absolutely committed to introducing this. The Liberal government in BC is, has a policy in favor of this option. The Brad Wall government in Saskatchewan is looking at this option. So the very rights that we have at this moment also have to be fought for because the only protection for academic freedom for the proper role of t uh, teachers and educators in the workplace is what you can do in collective bargaining. And if your rights and ability to bargain are undermined, all the rest of this becomes irrelevant. Thank you very much.